Good morning. It is uh, time to uh, go ahead and get started. Bible class. Is it all right if I get started, Chase? Or if, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate Rob uh, not telling everybody that I was filling in so that uh, we could still have a good crowd here this morning. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started uh, with a word of prayer. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us, for allowing us to, the opportunity to come together, uh, to study your word together. Uh, thank you for your word, for uh, preserving it for us, that we can simply pick it up and read it. We can understand. We can help each other with understanding. And we can know what your will is for us. And God, as we uh, continue in this period of, of study, please help us to open our minds and our hearts uh, to your word. Help us with understanding. Um, help us to glean uh, from your word the the lessons that we need to help us in our daily walk to be profitable uh, servants in your kingdom. Please be patient with us, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your son. And it's in his name that we uh, pray all these things. Amen. So, um, Rob may have done uh, uh, so, uh, some of this, but... Uh, what I like to do is kind of back up and get a run and start at things, right? Um, well, before I get into that, let me say this. Um, I, uh, I appreciate Rob asking me to, to, to fill in, and I'm, and I'm happy to do that. But in no way do I think that, uh, you know, that, that I am going to teach you something, right? The collective knowledge and wisdom in this room uh, far surpasses anything um, that, that, that certainly that, that I possess, right? And so I say that to say uh, this is a, th I'm facilitating a conversation, okay? Uh, and one thing that I love uh, so much about this uh, group of God's children is that we do have a lot of, uh, a lot of conversation and a lot of interaction during Bible class. Uh, so I say that to say, uh, don't stop that this morning. Uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to have a lot of conversation, a lot of back and forth, because again, I'm not here to teach. I'm here to facilitate uh, a continued conversation about uh, this book of Ephesians that, that, that we've been studying. Uh, and so as such, right, as I said, uh, I kind of like to back up and, and get a little run and start. And to me, context, uh, context is very important, right? Uh, context is, is important to us understanding um, uh, what's going on in the text. It can help us um, put ourselves in, uh, in, in some way, to a certain degree, in the same frame of mind as Paul was when he was writing it, right? And so it's been a long time since, we've, uh, since we started, well, over a year ago, uh, a study of the book of Acts, right? And so... Um, we're not going to back up and recap the entire uh, book of Acts, but uh, it, I think it is helpful, and I don't even know if is that pretty, yeah, you probably read that. Um, it, it's probably helpful to back up and remember uh, Paul's interactions with the church at Ephesus, or the city uh, of Ephesus before there was ever even a church there, right? So um, if you remember back in, uh, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on this, right? Uh, but just to, just to back up, like I said, and, and, and help us remember exactly what it is that Paul's relationship is uh, with these brethren in Ephesus. And so in Acts 18, uh, verses 18 through 21, this is the first record that we have of Paul's uh, interaction uh, in his visit to Ephesus. And this was on his second missionary journey. And as he was passing through, right, had, had gone through and, and really was on his way back, 
Uh, so Ephesus right here, okay? Um, so as Paul has, has gone up, made this journey through, across over into Macedonia, down through Achaia, over to Corinth, and, he, and really he's on his way back toward Jerusalem. On the way, he stops in uh, this city called Ephesus. And again, this is the first record that we have of, of him visiting there. And really, uh, the only thing that we know is it's just mentioned briefly that, um, that he reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue. Uh, we could assume by that description that there is not at this point a church that has been established there um, because Paul's uh, you know, general practice as he visited a new city was first go to the Jews, reason with them in the synagogue, and do that as long as possible until such time uh, as he can no longer do that, right? Um, he had some traveling companions with him. If I remember who that was that he picked up over here and took with him and dropped off in Ephesus? Priscilla and Aquila, right? So, so as he's making this journey back, Priscilla and Aquila are with him. He leaves them in Ephesus as he uh, continues on his journey back to Jerusalem uh, and then ultimately back on up to uh, his home congregation um, in Antioch. So, um, there is, and, and again, that's in Acts 18, uh, uh, verses 18 through 21. Uh, there's a, pa- a brief passage after that in Acts 18, verses 24 through 28, that talks a little bit about, very briefly, about what happened after Paul left, right? So Aquila and Priscilla uh, were left there. They were continuing to, to preach the gospel in Ephesus. And does anybody remember who they met? Who, who came along to Ephesus when Aquila and Priscilla were there? Apollos, absolutely, right? And so Apollos had, uh, did, did not know the entirety uh, of, of the plan and the story. And so we, uh, we see that in Acts uh, 18, that Aquila and Priscilla sat him down, talked to him, and then from that point on, he was very uh, instrumental in spreading of the gospel. Uh, and it says that they, while they were there, that they preached uh, and refuted uh, with the Jews, right? So after Paul has come through, planted Aquila and Priscilla there, for lack of a better term, moved on, the church really is established. As far as we can tell, that's when the church is established in Ephesus. Paul continues on, I said, and gets back up here, and then it just says he stayed for some time. No, how long that was, right? And then at the beginning of, uh, of Acts 19, again, not knowing how much time has elapsed, um, Paul begins his uh, third missionary journey, right? And so he does so, makes his way through here, and then where does he eventually stop? Ephesus, okay? And that is the first stop. Obviously, he, he stopped at many places along the way, but that's the first one that we're really told uh, uh, any great detail about what happens. So when Paul arrives... In Ephesus, it says in Acts chapter, um, chapter 19, in verse 1, what does he find when he arrives? He finds disciples. So there's a church there now, okay? And uh, if you keep on reading, the, these first disciples, he says there were 12 of them that, that, that he initially uh, came upon. Right, so there was there a, a discussion of John's baptism, a discussion of the Holy Spirit, and they said, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So he baptizes them. They had been baptized into the baptism of John. He baptizes them into, into uh, Christ. And then he lays his hands on them, right? And they receive spiritual gifts, the ability to, to do spiritual gifts, Okay. And I think that's pretty important uh, as we continue on. Um, but it, it, was, it stands to reason that at this time, uh, there is a congregation there. Uh, there is a, a church, uh, a group of believers. And at this point, they have received, by the laying on of apostles, uh, Paul, the apostles' hands, they've received the ability uh, to do um, 
uh, to perform miracles, to perform spiritual gifts. Okay? Uh, it says that Paul stayed there in Ephesus for three months in the synagogue. Right? That's how long he stayed in the synagogue reasoning. After three months, uh, there was enough um, pushback, stubbornness uh, is the term that's used, that, that some stubborn uh, Jews basically forced him out. And then from there, he went to uh, a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. Now, uh, again, the Hall of Tyrannus apparently was just, it, it, was, it was a place, right, So that, that he went. And he had access to it, and it was a place where people would come and learn, and whatever. And it says he was there daily for two years. So at this point, we know the church has been established, right? Paul went through on the second missionary journey. Aquila and Priscilla stayed there. They kept on teaching. Apollos came. They kept on teaching, teaching. There are disciples. He comes back through. There's a church. Uh, he stays for over two years, right? We know at least two years, three months, at least. So he knows them, okay? He knows them. This is not a, um, you know, like, uh, and not, not to get in the weeds too much here, right? But as he was passing through uh, on his way here, right? And he got to Thessalonica. He got run out of town in Thessalonica pretty quickly. So there was a church established there, but he didn't have time to stay and really know, that, right? Get to spend time with them, whatever. That is not the case in Ephesus. He has been here over two years at this point, Okay. Sure, and, and that's a great point, and that's one reason why I like to kind of back up every once in a while and put all the pieces together, right? Because you can see that uh, it, it's easy sometimes if we're studying a text that we just get so laser-focused on the text that we, be, we kind of forget um, the providence of God and all the, the, all the pieces as you're talking about. This person's here and that person's there, and this skill set, and God took that skill set, and there was, a, there was a gap here, but they, they can fill this one in, and that we can really see how God is, is masterminding uh, this, this great plan, just uh, you know, purely through his providence. So thank you. Um, okay, so he's there uh, two years, uh, three months or, or more. This is also, during this time, we have the story of the seven sons of Sceva, right? These folks that thought they were going to, uh, you know, cast out demons by invoking the name of Christ. And we have that whole ordeal where, you know, the demon was like, yeah, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, but I don't know who you are, right? And then he jumps on these seven guys and, and attacks them. And then uh, the the culminating event that ended his, uh, his stay in Ephesus. Does anybody remember what happened? They, that, the yes. Burn all their magic books. It said it come to some 50,000 pieces of silver, which is a huge sum, even back then in today's term. Yep. So then Demetrius comes along, who benefits from making all these idols and, and collecting monies off of this. He starts having a bid because uh, this is, hey, we're supposed to be the protectors of Artemis and Diana and Ephesians. And this is what people worship. But this, <coughs> That's it. Exactly right. So the riot in Ephesus caused by Demetrius the silversmith, 
as you said, directly impacting his uh, ability to make money. Like, hey, I make idols to these, you know, false gods. Um, and um, understanding, you know what's really interesting in that? Were there, were there other people? I mean, one could surmise, right? I don't know, past scripture doesn't tell us this, but just historically speaking, do you think there were other people in Ephesus who proclaimed other gods? What, one would have to think so. This is a very polytheistic culture, right? So what was, what was so unique about Paul's message that Demetrius clearly understood that's different than all these other folks preaching about all these other gods? Yeah, because if Paul's right, none of these other gods are real, None of this other stuff matters. It's Jehovah and nothing else. And Demetrius, he understood that, right? So this is a good example of somebody who heard the message, understood the message, uh, clearly understood it, and just and, and didn't like it, right? Um, so that was a very violent situation. If you'll remember, Paul was extracted because he was going in, right? Like, oh, those are my people in there. I'm going in. He was grabbed, pulled out. Hey, hey, uh, you, you got to get out of town. And so he did, right? And, and so he left town, and that is how he left. Uh, that's how he left Ephesus. Now, that is the last time that we know that he visited Ephesus. However, as he continues on, again, this is, this is on, the, on the, we'll call it the front leg of the uh, third missionary journey as he stopped in Ephesus. The journey continued on. A whole lot of things happened. We get him up here in Philippi, the conversion of a uh, Philippian jailer. We get him down here. He's run out of Thessalonica by some Jews that don't like him. Goes down to Berea. They follow him to Berea. He has to run out of there. Gets down here to Corinth. So... Um, Lots of stuff happening. He starts backtracking, going back up here. And when we get down here, uh, he's going to, he, it's, it, it, by this point, he's had the message. He, it's been revealed to him that he's got to get back to Jerusalem. And what's, what is awaiting him in Jerusalem? He's been told, God has told him this multiple times at this point. What is awaiting him in Jerusalem? I heard it. Bonds. He's going to be arrested. Yep. He's not necessarily told exactly what's going to happen, but he is assured when he gets back to Jerusalem, he is going to be in chains. Okay? And so he is, uh, he is on a mission to get back to Jerusalem to, uh, to face his imprisonment. And so as he's passing back through, you'll notice he stops right here, not in Ephesus. He stopped around uh, Acts... Um, uh, Acts 20, uh, toward the end of the chapter, uh, he is, I'll say somewhere, yeah, so he stops in Miletus and calls the Ephesian elders down to him. Anything, anything about that jump out at you? It's a really open-ended question. I like asking open-ended questions. Why wouldn't he want to go back to Ephesus? He doesn't say, but we could speculate, right? Possibly that he's just in a hurry, and he knows if he goes back to and he's like, well, last time I went there, I stayed two and a half years. Um, can't do that again. That's possible, because he does have to get back. It's also possible that, you know, when he left, they were trying to kill him. Uh, so that wouldn't be good. Um, we don't really know for sure.
I would say that's evident in many ways, but <clears throat> not the least of which that he's in a hurry to get back to go to jail. Good point, Carmen. Well, I think that's an excellent point because the elders, they are needing that strong encouragement that Mark's talking about. Because when you follow that story through, I mean, they embraced, they wept together. Right. You know, on his departure. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so, in, in his haste to get back, to your point, Mark, I've got to meet with these folks. I've, I've got to meet with him. Um, this is a side note, uh, but, you know, I don't want to pass by without pointing out they had elders. Um, you know, so this, this is a church that is, is at, at this point, just a few years old, and yet they had qualified uh, spiritual leaders in, in, in this congregation. And so they came down, they met with him in Miletus, and to, to your point, Ms. Carmen, they, you know, they wept, and this is where Paul told them, I will never see you again. So, keep that in mind as we uh, get back into uh, the, the study of the book of, of Ephesians, and keep in mind, this is a letter he's writing to people that he spent a lot of time with, he dearly loved, and he has told them that he'll never see them again. <clears throat> um, oh, yeah. All right. So, um, after, uh, after the events of the third missionary journey, we know he did make his way back. We know that he got uh, uh, arrested um, we know that there were uh, trials. Uh, we know all the, you know, multiple people that he appeared in front of. We know all of the plots to try to assassinate him. Um, and ultimately, that led to, um, that led to Paul... <coughs> Being taken uh, from Jerusalem up to uh, up to Caesarea. Uh, does anybody remember? So he was in, in at this point. He was in custody of Rome. Okay, uh, of of the of the Roman government. Does anybody remember how long he stayed in Caesarea under like basically arrest? Two years. So he was in Caesarea, uh, arrested uh, for two years. And uh, again, there were multiple trials. There was changing of, uh, of, of authorities and so on and so forth. We won't go back and get into all the details. All of that is in Acts. Um, uh, and then we can see that um, at that point, he had to appeal to Caesar. Um, and that meant that they had an obligation, because Paul was a Roman citizen, they had an obligation to transport him safely from Caesarea uh, to Rome where he could stand trial in front of Caesar, or at least in Caesar's court, court right? So then we see the whole, you know, we know his whole journey to, to Rome and all the things shipwrecked over here, blah, 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 so on and so forth. All right, so he gets up to Rome. So the very... Very last thing that we're told in the book of Acts is he arrived in Rome and he was, we'll call it house arrest, imprisoned, you know, what, whatever you want to call it. How long was he in prison in Rome? Anybody remember? What's that? It was two years as well, right? So at this point, um, uh, 
we know that there are two separate two-year imprisonments uh, of Paul. So he's been in prison for four, for four years. Okay, and the only reason I bring that up is uh, is to say that when we go back and we try to figure out exactly when the book of Ephesians was written, uh, as as Rob has uh, already very well pointed out, he mentions in the book of Ephesians his imprisonment, right? So we know it had to have been written uh, within that four-year period when he was either in prison in Caesarea or in prison in Rome. And if you look at, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you look at all four uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the prison epistles, right? Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Uh, and, you, and you kind of cross-reference all of the things that are mentioned about imprisonment and who is with him and this and that, you can piece all four of those books together that they were all written during the two years that he was in prison in Rome. I'm not going to go into all the details on that, but if you happen to have, uh, if you happen to have this book, um, take a look at this. Uh, uh, brother and sister uh, Waldron did a very good job uh, I'll even uh, I'll even give you the uh, I'll cheat and tell you it's on page 214. Uh, if you want to go back and read, it, they they do a very very good job of detailing. Um, you know, it says this in this book and this in that book, and and you can just put the pieces of the puzzle together and see this was written uh, during his two year imprisonment uh, in Rome. So, ma'am. ma'am. Um, now, in Ephesus? Caesarea. Uh, in Caesarea, okay. And so, and this would have been, this would have been Caesarea, uh, it, it doesn't call it this in Scripture, but it's, it's Caesarea Maritima uh, down here. There's a Caesarea Philippi that's, I think, over here, but this is Caesarea Maritima would be the, the city where they were. It wasn't too, you can see it, it's not too terribly far from Jerusalem. Uh, so there still were a lot of Jews, uh, Jews in that area. Um, okay. Anything, any questions, comments about that? Uh, so then the next thing is just, again, just for my mind to frame everything out, um, just a, that's just a real, real quick outline of the, um, you know, of the book, uh, of Ephesians. And I will say I stole a couple of these, the, the, the two main headers there I did steal from, uh, brother and sister, uh, Waldron. Because I thought that uh, their synopsis of uh, kind of breaking the book down into two sections was, was pretty spot on, right? I mean, if you have to do it, you can basically say the first three chapters are that, uh, you know, God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then the second three chapters are just, you know, therefore, live accordingly. Um, and, and that's a pretty good way to break that down, uh, in my opinion. And so... Where we're going to pick up today, after that very lengthy uh, intro, I did that because I, I knew that I'll, I also have Wednesday night, and so uh, when Rob gets back, we won't still be in the exact verse that he left on. Um, but I, I, for my sake, and I don't know if it was beneficial for anybody else, but for my sake, it's good to just kind of back up big picture and then and then get kind of a a run and start at this thing. So. With that being said, we did cover uh, Wednesday evening um, the first few verses in, uh, in chapter 3 of Ephesians. So we won't go back through those in a tremendous amount of detail, um, but I do want to touch on a couple of things. Um, and, and, and we can just, uh, we're not going to read the passage, um, but let's, let's touch on... Uh, one thing, when, when a passage starts out, so there in verse 1, so it says, for this reason, right? Uh, I think it's good 
to always back up uh, and say, what, what's the reason? Like, you know, if he says, oh, for this reason, so on and so forth, whatever. What, what is the reason, right? What reason is he, uh, is he referencing? So I think if we back up uh, a few verses into chapter 2, um, the reason that he's talking about what he is talking about, this, this mystery of the gospel revealed, is the reason he's talking about that is, the, is of course, that Jews and Gentiles uh, are being brought together, right? This unity. Um, and then he says, therefore, uh, you know, this is why he was appointed uh, to preach to the Gentiles, okay? Uh, and we talked about that. Uh, we talked about that on, uh, on Wednesday night. Um, he mentions in verse 6, uh, the mystery. Oh, man. Uh, he mentions in verse six. He says, "This mystery. Uh, uh, what? It, what is the mystery that he's talking about?" Yeah. So this is the mis- that he's, This mystery that he's talking about. The mystery of the gospel. The mystery is, oh, Gentiles can be uh, can be saved too. Uh, I mean, why is that a mystery? It doesn't, it's not a mystery to us. <laughs> We're Gentiles. <laughs> and, and, and we have the advantage of living 2,000 years later. Uh, Frank? All right. Yeah, good point. Barry? Um, I just thought, you know, when we think about it, like, why is it a mystery? What kind of mystery is it? Um, for the audience or for the general, you know. Verse um, 16, where he says that, you know, the Gentiles are going to be partakers of the promise, right? Uh, the reason, in my mind, that this would have been mysterious is because, you know, like, promises to Abraham were understood to be very centered to the children of Israel, right? Yep. Um, but this is clarifying, just in case there's any, uh, you know, misunderstanding that, you know, the promise of, you know, the whole world being blessed, this applies to the Gentiles. Whereas I think that would have been understood before it was very Israel-centric. And I think that, that kind of put a lot of weight, made a lot of weight for the Yep. Nope. That's good. And a perfect segue uh, to, we didn't even plan that, uh, to this. So um, I, I'm sure some of you have, uh, I mean, everybody's probably seen graphs that are similar to this. This is just a, a, a quick Google search and uh, of three different ones that kind of popped up. But we've all seen this, uh, or similar charts that talk about three different dispensations, right? And we talk about, and we call it the patriarchal uh, era, even though that's not a term that's used in Scripture. I think it's an accurate uh, uh, enough way to describe the things that we do uh, read in Scripture. And then we talk about that second dispensation being the Mosaic period or the period of law. There are different terms. And then the third dispensation uh, where we are now being the dispensation of Christ because Christ has come, fulfilled the promise, so on and so forth. 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not saying that I have an issue with any of these things, okay? So I don't, I don't want to give that impression. But, but I will say there's one thing, I don't think these are wrong, but there's one thing about this that I think is, is incomplete. And that is they're all presented, this is my nerdism coming out, okay? They're all presented in a linear fashion. As if to say it's one, two, three. You say, well, Daniel, like time is linear. Like, yeah, okay, I get that. But you know what? You know what this leaves out? Presenting it graphically in this manner. You know what this leaves out? It leaves out the fact that just like Murray said, the law was only given to the Jews. Okay? The law. It wasn't, oh, there's this patriarchal, you know, period, whatever, where God just spoke to the patriarchs and everybody just knew what they were supposed to do, you know, whatever. And then, oh, then comes the law, and so the patriarchal era stops. That's not what happened, right? Because what, what were the, the Gentiles that lived during this period, what law were they living under? Right. Nothing changed. Right? So the other thing I don't like about this is uh, it's not to scale. Okay? And what I mean is uh, these are all uh, graphically represented as, uh, you know, equal in time. Now, uh, what I do like about this particular one is it does have a little note there, Law of Moses was only for the Jews, and then it gives some time periods. And whether you agree with these as exact numbers or just general whatever, most conservative, by the most conservative estimate, if we're going to say from creation to now has been roughly 6,000-ish years, okay? 4,000 of those were before Christ. So for 4,000 years... Every human being that lived, other than the Jews during 1,500 of those 4,000 years, every other human being that lived was not under this codified, delineated law, right? There was the law that we call, you know, the law of patriarchs or whatever we want to call it. I say all that to say... If the question in the context of Ephesians is, why is this a mystery? Why is it such a mystery to the Jews and to the Gentiles that now everybody has access to God through Christ? Why is that such a mystery? Because for the majority of human existence, there was no understanding of a codified law of God. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Anybody disagree? Lance disagrees. Uh, I'm no, just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was Right, that's right. Um, and not just, uh, you know, this, this isn't like, hey, let's pick on the Jews, right, because they are humans, and we do the same thing, right? We, we humanity, we've always, we've always done the same thing. We've kind of missed the point. Um, so, all right, Ms. Carmen. Thank you. 
And, and that's true, and there, and there have always been those, and, and so I, would, I do want to back up and clarify, um, uh, you know, there have always been those who, regardless of access to revelation or whatever, they don't care. That is not to say that because the, the, for the majority of human existence there was no access or understanding of a codified law. That does not mean that I'm not saying that God, you know, that they didn't have any chance to live righteously in front of God and that they have no chance for salvation. That is not, that is not the, the case at all. You know, Romans chapter 1 addresses that pretty clearly, right? Um, so, all right. Um, any other questions, comments about that? All right. Um, so now that class is over and we're getting to the verse where uh, Rob left off, um, we'll just, um, uh, I'll, I'll steal a couple more minutes. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll at least get it started. Um, so he says, uh, so he says there, in just beginning of verse 8, um, he says, To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Why, and I think this is pretty easy for us to surmise why he's saying this, but why does he refer to himself as the least of all saints? We could guess. Because of his background. Yeah. He started off his, his, uh, uh, his interactions with Christians by persecuting them, chasing them down, having them imprisoned, and, and, and approving of their death, if not actively participating. Um, though he doesn't say that expressly here, it is, it is safe to assume that is uh, what's in his mind as he's saying this. Um, so... Also, what jumps out at me, this is just me, is in verse 8, he says, This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles. He refers to his mission as grace. Now, I think we use the term grace a lot, and we understand, um, uh, you know, that grace is something that, that's given to us. But do, do, we, do we ever think of or, or maybe even see in Scripture very often um, a mission or a task referred to as grace? to God's people, not you, but the Christians. So God give me grace to forgive me for what I have done. And now he's making a mention or an ambassador for his faith to go preach it to people who I didn't think deserved it because they were not Jews. But now that they're included, and God's showing me, I, I give you grace now you need to show these people grace is for them also. These that are in grafted branches. Mm -hmm. These who are not heirs, but now are made heirs. And we see that with all through Paul's letters when he talks about how they were put back in when they weren't to be begin with. Yep, uh, that's a good point. What, what, is great, what is grace, right? I think Christianity, for very broad term, Christianity limits God's grace to only forgiving us, forgiveness of sin. Right. And, and you already pointed out the definition is Undeserved. Thank you. 
Okay. It does. It does. And you know, and that, and that's in in a you know, pivot off that, and that's a whole different topic we could we could get into. That we're not we're not going to, not in the last one minute of class. Um, is you know why didn't God just on day one? Hey, here's the plan. Right? He could have, um, but obviously he knows more than we do, and he knew that we weren't capable as man to understand and, and to get that. And so we needed um, we needed all these different steps uh, for the the unveiling uh, of the plan. Um, yes. Right. That's right. All right. Well, that's a good place to end. Uh, and I appreciate uh, everybody's comments. Uh, we'll pick up there on Wednesday evening, Lord willing.